Are any of you people a mem members of the World Future Society? Uh, I'm sure most of you heard of Arthur C. Clarke. Will you raise your hands? Good. He said that if he wrote a book that everybody enjoyed and understood, he said he wouldn't be saying anything new. Think about that. What I'm going to talk about is going to change some of your lives, the way you look at yourself and the way you look at the world around you. The subject matter is not the kind of matter to get from ordinary sources or books. So I would like your participation in an experiment. And some of you might be able to tell what it is that I draw on the board before I finish. And if you know what it is, interrupt, say, I got it. So I'm going to start. Can all of you see the board? I don't think I can make it with this. Um, can all of you see the board? Can you hear me all right? OK. The minute you know what it is, interrupt. Sinking ship, the Titanic. What is it? Titanic. Okay, great. Now, if he didn't call that, remember, there's no ship there at all. There was enough bits for his associative memory to put that together. Now, you know that's not a ship. Now, what is this? Some of you older people might guess this. An alarm clock. Who did that? You are amazing. <laughs> That's no, where's the alarm clock? Well, anyway, if she didn't call that, if she wasn't able to call that, I would have put the little the legs on it and the clock and Hamilton watch coming every, until somebody called it. Now, if you, there are still some that cannot see the ship. So I would have gone all along, put all the windows in, Titanic, everything, until somebody got up and said, yeah, Titanic. Well, this, is an attempt to prove that all of us are capable of making decisions and arriving at a conclusion without all of the information prepared for us. That is a unique quality in human beings. We can put things together, and we don't, do not require the accumulation of a great deal of information. In this system, if you understand this system quite well, who would you say this is? Who said that? Who said that? Lincoln. I don't see Lincoln, but it's Lincoln. It would have been Abraham Lincoln. When I got through with it, I would have gone on with the beard and all of the stuff. So this is just to prove that people can put something together. And I'm going to try to explain to you just what creative thinking really is. Now, I'm going to use old language, the language that I use with people who are not familiar with this way of thinking. The old language is that people can think and reason. I do not believe that is possible. I have many inventions. I've worked on many different things. But I do not believe that human beings can think or reason. This is what I do believe. By the way, you don't have to accept anything I say. During the question period, don't be polite. Come at it from all angles. Break it down if you can. This helps me, and it helps you. So when I talk about thinking and reasoning and putting things together, we're talking about the forces that shape human behavior. I believe that all human behavior is lawful. That that the reactions and values that all people have are perfectly lawful to the environment that they come from. So every human being is perfectly well adjusted from where they are coming from, from their background and experience. If you, as a baby, were raised by the Seminole Indians, you would behave, if you never saw anything else, like a Seminole Indian. 
and if you were brought up in any other Indian group and you had feathers in your head, in your hat, in your headgear, and you were dancing around the fire, and I walked over and said, that's ridiculous, what are you dancing around the fire with the feathers for? You don't take your hat, throw it on the ground, and say, you know, I never thought of it that way. We can't do that. We're victims of culture. We look at the world with our background. We have no other way of doing it. Psychology is kind of a, a rudimentary form today, an attempt to grasp at the factors that shape human behavior, the factors that are responsible for the way we look at ourselves, other people, and the way we behave, or, if you wish, misbehave. I don't believe that any human being misbehaves. They use whatever tools they know of, whatever tools they're familiar with. Language is a tool. If someone to sh were to show you a picture of an airplane, what appeared to be an airplane, without wings, well, people look at it and they stand by and they say, it'll never fly. But they don't say, how do you propose to lift off the ground without wings? That's the key to communication. Now, a very famous scientist, deceased now, tried to get the government and people to put up sufficient funds to monitor outer space to try to make contact with extraterrestrial life. I want to try to say this to you and think about what I say. Toss it around. I'm using the old language because you're not that familiar with these values. If people or beings or things can travel a hundred million light years through time and space, they are not humanoid. The storage system for water would occupy miles. And all of the facilities required by humans would, re would take up tremendous amounts of space and require tremendous amounts of energy. Now, there are people that talk of flying saucers of land here on Earth. And they go to some farmer, you know, and they, they take him into the saucer and they do all kinds of experiments on them. Now, first of all, People do not travel hundreds of millions of light years to pick up some farmer and ask him what kind of suspenders he wears. <laughs> Carl Sagan wanted to communicate with extraterrestrials. He hoped that they, in turn, would communicate with us. Now, you know that the Republicans can't communicate with the Democrats. <laughs> You know that husbands and wives have difficulty in communicating. Children and parents have difficulty because the language we use was designed a long time ago. And it is inherently difficult to get ideas across in the language that we use today. However, when engineers meet and talk, they speak a different language. One engineer might present a very thin cable and says, this can support 5,000 tons. And the other engineer says, what's its tensile strength? And he's given that information. Then he puts it in a machine. I don't know whether he knew this. And he snaps it to make sure that it holds to that. When engineers design an airplane, well, We'll probably be chasing this around. They, they do all the calculations. This is a front view, a very rapid drawing of a front view of an airplane. They do all the rapid calculations, and they figure what that wing will be able to support. And after all their calculations, and after they're certain, they then pile sandbags on the wing. Did you know that? Until it breaks off to make damn sure that it does the job. Now, that does not exist in everyday language. In everyday language, you don't have that ability. When an engineer meets another engineer, he says, I can illuminate an area with this tiny point of light that has uh, 50,000 square feet. The engineer says, well, that's not possible. He doesn't talk like that. He says, how do you power that unit? What kind of voltage does it take? How do you illuminate that spot? They ask questions. The average person, yeah, nah, not in a thousand years. That's been around for a long time. That is a language of war, of hatred, of bigotry, of prejudice, the inability to ask questions. And we've got to be very careful about that. 
And at one lecture I remember at Princeton, I was trying to say that human beings cannot think or reason. This is a psychology department and sociology. But one of the individuals stood up, one of the staff, and he said, all right, where did the camera come from? There were no cameras at one time. Someone had to think about a camera. He just doesn't come out of the thin air. And after doing a lot of work, many years ago in ancient Egypt, or if you live out in the country, or have lived out in the country, if there was a hole in the barn wall, that is, a knot was knocked out, the cows on the outside appeared on the wall of the barn, upside down. And in Egypt, you went in this dome to see the upside down world. There was a little hole here, and the daylight came in, and you saw people walking upside down on the wall. How many of you have experienced that kind of phenomenon? That is essentially the box hole camera. A camera, the simple camera without a lens, is just a little hole in a box. And somebody said, well, how can I make, how can I see that image? And they used a transparent membrane back here, and they could see the upside down head or a person or a cow. And they asked this question, if only I can retain that image. Well, that isn't the answer, that's just the question. I wonder how I could retain that image. So, years before that, the American Indians and other primitives have taken tapa cloth, or they'd weave um, natural materials into a kind of a fabric. And then they would take berry juices and dye it different colors. Sometimes a leaf would fall upon that surface, and after the sun dried it, they had an image of the leaf. So they began to use dyes from this background. That all human beings, to understand me better, the first human being that jumped off a precipice with wings, he died. And his brother-in-law wrote, next time, make the wings larger. <laughs> no one starts out right away and solves a problem, unless you have a tremendous background in many different areas. Well, the next guy that jumped off, he jumped off with the larger wings. And he flew a little, and then they went. And the old fisherman said, you got to brace them wings like a boat, like a mast. They're not going to hold, so they braced it. And then they jumped off the precipice, this individual, and he flew, and he hit a tree. And he hurt his leg real badly. And his wife said, you know, John, a fish has a rudder. Good point. And they stuck the rudder on the airplane. No one ever sat down and invented a television set, an airplane, the electric light, wireless. None of that came about by men walking in and deep concentration. And then, through some ethereal substance, bingo, the idea is formulated. It doesn't work that way. It's hard work. And I make more mistakes than anybody I know, because I try more things. There's nothing wrong with building something and finding out that it doesn't work. This is where you get your experience. There's nothing wrong with criticism. I remember the first model airplanes I built went nosing into the ground, and I was ashamed of them. And uh, a young engineer told me that my center of gravity had to be corrected, that is, move the wing forward. And so all of us stand on the shoulders of one another and we shape the future. Another question that was asked, well, somebody had to invent the bow and arrow. Somebody had to think of it. It just didn't come out of nowhere. Well, I talked to many Indians. And after talking to many Indians, this is when I found out that Indians used to skin animals. And this is a lousy drawing of the skin of an animal stretched out in the sun. When the Indians got back, the skin was half the size. It shrunk and became thicker. And they didn't like that at all. So they cut leather into strips, thin strips. And they took an existing frame, and they tied that skin to the frame. Some of you may have seen this. It was lace of leather all the way prevented from shrinking. But when they cut the strips of leather and put them out in the sun, they shrunk and became fat and short. And they were displeased with that. 
After many, many years, one Indian tied that strand of leather to a piece of wood, a, a stick, a stick. He split the top, tied a knot, and tied the leather to the stick. When he came back, hoping that it would dry and not shrink, the stick took this form. It was bent. Ah. He plucked at it and went bang. Well, and after many years, somebody took another piece of wood, put it in, and pulled the string, and off it went. Well, if man can't think or reason, where did the movie camera come from? Somebody had to think of that. It doesn't exist out there. Well, here's where it came from. Many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, in China, they used to take a candle, and they'd take some bamboo paper at the time, and put it in front of the candle, and then they'd cut out a little figurine of a human being and put the candle behind it. And as the candle undulated, the little person would dance, and they'd play music. That was the beginning. How did that happen? Some guy had a candle and a piece of paper, and he, was, he was just happened to be behind it, and his finger m appeared to move on the screen. And so he extracted or built upon that phenomena. Then later, something interesting occurred. The Chinese used to take these tremendous scrolls and open them up. Well, they then later taped, or they wired, or they used gut and tied many pages together and built a kind of a pad. But in order to get to a particular page, the Oriental would mark the corner of the page so that they can find with a symbol. And as you flip through the pages fast, that little dot would jump all over the place. Well, years later, an individual drew various successive pictures of a bird in flight and put them down on the corner of the paper and flipped it. And the little bird wings began to move up and down. Well, a Frenchman saw that and he took a little pieces of cardboard and he put them in a circular pattern. Uh, I'm going to try to get it down as clear as I can quickly. And he put a crank up here that you turn, and the little pictures would go around the circle. And the Chinese had something like this also, and they had a bamboo interrupter that would just hold the picture for a few seconds, a second, less than a second. As you turned it, a man appeared to move across the screen. Well, the French machine machined that out of brass did a beautiful job, and when you turn the crank, the person walked with smoother motions rather than these abrupt motions. Edison saw that unit that the Frenchman designed, and he turned it into this position. I, I guess I can't work with that microphone. Uh, can you hear me back there? Okay. And what happened is, uh, he turned it into a vertical position, and all the pictures were set in a circular fashion. Excuse and you me. turned the crank here. Yeah. Excuse me. They won't get the audio on the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you just okay. put it in your pocket or something? I'll try. <laughs> here, hook it to your waist. Thanks. Roxanne is my associate. She works on all the buildings and all the things that we've developed in the Venus Project, which I'll talk to you about later. And he, Edison purchased this, put a magnifying glass in front of it, and you put a nickel in, and you turn the crank, and you saw people moving. A bunch of still photographs. It was a long, slow process. Nobody, no individual invented the camera. A little bit here, a little there, added to that, and eventually the Wright brothers read about experimental aircraft, where thousands of people died trying to develop a flying machine. And after picking up bits of this information, including man carrying kites from China thousands of years ago, and they built the first flying machine. And they were called the father of flight. Again, there's no father of anything. You may take an idea so far, you add to it, and gradually it's built up. A genius, a genius is a person that has been exposed to many different systems, and therefore they can come up with a wide range of solutions. A man like Leonardo da Vinci, 
You think that he, he just evolved out of nothing? He spoke to people that were interested in mechanics in his time. They gathered and they shared ideas, but you only hear of da Vinci. Unfortunately, guys like Nikolai Tesla, Edison, all the great innovators of the past have been influenced by other people. And the mythical structures that we build around inventors, that they inherit special abilities, they are geniuses, or they're in tune with the infinite mind, and the ideas somehow filter in. Well, this is the kind of nonsense. It's the same story about, is there intelligent life out there? The real question is, is there intelligent life here? <laughs> we don't think so, not yet. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm not kidding. What is intelligence? Well, I know. the ability to reason things out, you can't have that ability unless you've had experience in particular areas. An Eskimo never dreams, I repeat this, of walking on a palm-fringed beach. Can you understand that? It is not possible unless he has seen motion pictures or something about the beach. It is not possible for any human being to build a frame of reference of any kind without experience. I know where every invention I ever made came from. I know the influence, the books I've read, the people I've known, everything that shaped those values. <laughs> and sometimes people say, well, when did you think of that wonderful idea? It was the February the 1st? No, it's cumulative bits of information that we put together with experience. So all of the artificial structures and artificiality of all societies, they are all primitive today. They are all backward. The very fact that we use political systems, the very fact that there are Democrats and Republicans and notions about how the world ought to be governed. Now scientists could not do a thing with that. If you want to put a man on the moon, you have to know what the distance is precisely. You have to know how much material you're lifting up toward the moon. You have to know how much force a human body can stand. Well, to start with, they don't have that information. So they build special devices, a big centrifuge. They put a human being in it, and they whirl it around. They say, how are you doing? And the guy conks out, and they say, well, this is how fast you can rotate certain groups of people. And they build data, and from that data, they plan the moon voyage. The question then is, what kind of world do we want? How is it that we want our social system to operate? What makes criminal behavior? What are the factors that make a Jeffrey Dahmer? I'm sure you know who that was. Before Jeffrey, there was Albert Fish. I don't know if any of you remember Albert Fish. Albert Fish was a fine-looking gentleman. He ate 45 children. Well, you wonder how can anyone do that kind of thing? I'm gonna to try to give you some idea of the background of Albert Fish. When he was a youngster, about 10 years old, he was touching his private parts. His mother was an old-time Baptist, and she says, you are going straight to hell. You will burn eternally, and that kid, Albert Fish stuck needles into his genitals because he didn't want to burn in hell. And he took other children into empty lots and cut off their private parts because he wanted to save them. If you're brought up in a distorted environment, which we all live in today, any judge that wraps the gavel and says 30 years is an ignoramus because he has no idea of the factors that shape human behavior. When you become aware, if you bring up a healthy boy with about six women, and one of the girls says, oh, did I see a gorgeous hat? That boy will pick up the same mannerisms, same facial expressions, and say, oh, I just love that hat. Because if that's the environment, if you're brought up in Italy, you say, hey, what's the matter? You like or you don't like? In other words, it depends on where you're brought up. Did you know that Lincoln was Irish? It depends on your, your group and the values that you exchange. 
And if you want a world without war, without hatred, without crime, and without stupidity, it can be arranged if you follow this bit. If we consider at some time, which society will at a later time, I hope it would be sooner, that all of the earth become the common heritage of all nations. All of the resource of the earth, the common heritage of all nations. And if you believe in God, if you understand the teachings of all religions, there were no property lines in heaven, no banks, no personal positions in which one person is elevated above another. That if the earth were the common heritage of all nations and all of the artificial boundaries removed that separate people, there would be no basis for war, no basis for armament. The world you live in is an old world. Its language is old. Its values are old. And our institutions of education fail to touch the social system. You want to be careful. Don't touch that. This is an area that you don't want to get involved in. Well, in order for you to grow, in order for you to make the world a better place, you have to face this situation. I don't say that people are going to sit back and do that. According to all historical records, no civilization, anyway, to my knowledge, has ever sit back to plan the future exactly what we're going to do, how we're going to live, how we're going to work out transportation. No. We just build highways all over the place. Although you go to school and you learn something, you learn that a straight line is the shortest distance between two given points. Well, look at a road map of the United States, and I think you'll find spaghetti all over the place. Rarely do you see that. Look at your cities, every building a different size and shape. This does not express individuality. It's utter chaos. At 4 o'clock, all the cars come out of this building, and they can't get across that bridge. So you've got to build another bridge. So you elect people to political office that are totally incompetent. They are neurally bankrupt. I don't care whether you're Democrat or Republican. They don't have the value system to solve these problems that exist. They are not educated in that way. They are brought up with a uniform set of values. And they go out into the world, and this is a sad story of coming events. There are computers today, there are machines in existence today that can handle 500 trillion bits of information per second. No human comes anywhere near that. And you think that in the next 15 or 20 years there's going to be people in government? No way. For example, if you took a group of computers and arranged them in a special fashion and ran the electrical tentacles out to the agricultural belt with probes into the soil, when the water table dropped, that would turn on the pumps and bring the water into the area. If the nutrients changed, it would pump nutrients into the area. What kind of world do you want? I don't think any of you here, maybe a few of you, might remember when human beings used to operate elevators. They'd turn a crank. They never quite got to the floor. you up and down. Finally, they became automated. Step back. It's a lovely day today. How are you, Mr. Jones? If they scan your face. And they'll take you exactly to that floor. After that comes the transveyor. An elevator that moves up and down, sideways, all directions. You get on it and verbalize. I want to go to the art center, music center. And it'll take you there. The kind of world you live in and the automobiles that exist as transportation units are dangerous because they have a bumper in front and one in the back. And I'm sure that if an extraterrestrial visited the Earth, they said, what are those shiny things in front and back of the vehicle? Well, they're bumpers. They're, they're, they're prevent damage. Well, don't you ever hit on the side? Why isn't the bumper all around the car? And then they came with the airbag. And they put an airbag in front of you. If you get hit on the side, your head goes right through the glass. They had a long time, the automobile companies, a long time to solve those problems. And then you see motorcycle policemen pull over. What do you think you're going? See, all you have to do in a car, if you wanted to, I wouldn't do it. 
I wouldn't even put this in a car, is put a sort of a chymograph or a cylindrical recorder. When you go through a 30 mile an hour zone to 50 miles an hour, it's recorded on there. And every month you have to tear that strip out of your car and mail it into the police department. <laughs> well, the police wouldn't like that. But how many violations do you think you'd have? There are better ways than that. You just make a car intelligent. Now here's what that means. How intelligent can a machine be? Well, if you took a, there's a little gadget called a pressure transducer. If you squeeze it, it generates electricity. So let's put one in each tire. And let's say that you pick the front right tire. It goes to a recording, says, ouch, my front right tire. Now, of course, if you pick any tire, it'll, it'll verbalize. But if you kick it hard, it'll say, ouch, my front right tire. And if you kick it again, say, who do you think you are? Do you want to give a machine feelings? Do you want to give a machine compassion, love, warmth? I'll tell you why they leave it out of machines, because it doesn't work. Human emotions that you learn are the most significant and most important differences between men and machines. Human emotion is a very touchy subject. It's like racing your engine at a stoplight, you know. It doesn't take you anywhere. It doesn't serve any purpose. If you get a lump in your throat when you see hungry people, that's emotional. But when you increase the agricultural yield per acre, that's caring. That's love. Love is transforming all of the verbal and paper proclamations to a way of life. The shameful thing about our century is that there was only one Edison, one Louis Pasteur, one Nikolai Tesla, one Madame Curie. We should have had thousands of them, and we will, once we get rid of the artificial boundaries that separate people, once we get rid of nationalism, patriotism. Again, I do not mean to offend anybody. All that I ask you to do is think about this, toss it around. This is what the Venus Project advocates. The Venus Project is a design for culture in which we bridge the difference between all nations. How is that done? By a universal language, the blueprint. If you open a blueprint in Japan, they know what you're talking about. If you do a, write a prescription for England, Japan, France, the pharmacologist understands that. There's no discrepancies. There's no ambivalence. I wonder what he meant by that. It's clear. The language we use daily is not. The language of warmth and love are verbal excuses and verbal outlets for some people for avoiding their responsibility to make the world a better place for everyone. The smarter your kids are, the richer my life. Every kid on corner shooting up drugs, going nowhere, you're going to have to pay for in the future. Therefore, it is efficient and functionally selfish to build a better world for everyone. If you try to do it, people come to me all the time and they say, can you design a city with a wall high enough so when the U2K problem comes, or the system breaks down, or the banks fail, we will be protected. I said, sure, I can design that. But there are people that will drive by with launching mechanisms right over your little wall. There's no place you can hide. We have 25 acres. People call it Eden too. It's beautiful. But if the bottom falls out of this culture, there will be people at my front gate with children. How about some food just for the kids? The next day, 50 people. Everything looks solid to you. Everything looks solid and stable. And the future looks promising. But here's the truth. I have seen an XY plotter, that is a machine that moves in three dimensions. They put a, a scalpel in that machine and an X-ray of a brain tumor. And this machine removed the brain tumor on a cadaver and about one-tenth the time. And doctors think, ah, oh, just the industrial work on the production line. He's on the way out, but not me. I can think. Now, let me say this again. The typewriters that work the speech, today you talk to your computer, and you get a type, and also corrects your English, restructures your sentences, makes recommendations. How much longer do you think people are going to be in, in positions in industry 
and government making their own decisions. We don't believe that anyone ought to make decisions. We believe that people ought to arrive at decisions. Now here's what that means. You go across the country and pick up samples of the soil from all over the nation. You bring it to central agriculture, analyze that soil, and then turn to your health department and ask them what people need, manganese, whatever they need. And what is this soil good for? What should we grow? Tomatoes, and then rotate the crop, move to something else. That's what I mean by surveying the conditions. Now, what's your opinion? What's your opinion? Democracy is a crude and vulgar system and should have been phased out centuries ago. But we don't have enough outside points of view on radio and television. When I talked this way on the Larry King show, he said to me, just a minute, I depend on those people that you're attacking. I wasn't attacking the automobile companies. I just said that if you did that, it would be safer. If you put proximity units on automobiles, most of you have them in your home now. When you walk over the building, the light goes on. That's a proximity unit. Put that in your car. And if you're backing up and a child is crawling behind you, it stops, no matter how much you step on the gas. I don't want any signs slippery when wet. I want an abrasive put in the highway and take that sign down so it's not slippery when wet. I don't want to say to kids, stay away from drugs. I want to make life so interesting for people that they don't want drugs. They don't want to dull their senses. They want to become keen and they want to become fully aware, I'm using older language, and conscious of their surroundings. It is painful to deaden your awareness when life is beautiful when what you do goes out to people and makes their lives better. In one session at Princeton, I changed the values of many people. They walked out discussing this for years thereafter, and I still get letters today. I went into an area of New York called Hell's Kitchen. The kids there were considered very bad, bad. And the social worker used to wear a necktie and eyeglasses, and anyone who wore eyeglasses when I was a kid was a sissy. And when you wear a necktie and a suit, and you're talking to these kids in rags in the slums, they look at you as an outsider. You're unacceptable to them. So I put a wire recorder out in the front office. And after the social worker talked to the young boy, by the way, they made guns out of water pipe. And they go, how many of you knew that? They didn't go and buy guns, they made them. And the social worker picked the gun out. He said, you're going to take someone's eye out and wind up in a state penitentiary, hurt your mother and father. You want to do that? Well, the kid says nothing at all. Now, when the kid walks out, I make a wire recording of the way he talks to his friend. And he said, joke, the guy up front, the social worker. Then I walk over the social worker. How'd you make out with Johnny? I had a good talk with the boy. I believe we established rapport. <laughs> How do you know that? He says, I felt it intuitively. Then I play the tape. By the way, it was a wire recorder. I play the tape of the kid's answers. And he says, I'm grateful so-and-so. I said, no, no, just say, I don't know how to get to Johnny. I know how to get to Billy. I tried eight different methods. None of them worked. So I said, watch what I do next week. I walked in the office, picked up the gun. I said, I understand you made this gun. He said, I told the guy I made it last week. This is in New York City. I used to make recordings of this. I wanted to use it in a film later. And I picked up the gun, and I'm looking at it, and I'm shaking my head. He says, what's the matter with it? He says, come in. The damn pin is an eighth of an inch off center. He says, yeah. And I said, if you put a couple of washers on the side, you can move the pin right on center. He said, hey, do you work here? I said, what, with those jerks? Nah. <laughs> can I bring my friends over to meet you? That's people like him with similar values. Then you go to work in their terms, not your terms. Real psychology has to be related to the real world, not theory, not lab experiments in, in schools where you're not in touch with people, where you don't get the feel of people, where you don't get the sense of their, their identification with the world around them. I have changed many of those kids. And I brought a gun in for them to look at, and said, I made this gun. Wow, they said. I sure would like to be able to make a gun like that. I said, well, I can help you do it. You can, 
Well, what do I have to do? I have to learn how to draw a front view of a gun, a side view of a gun. I know I'm going fast and over a lot of going. You have to make three views to the gun so it can be made. He said, you know, I'm going to learn to do that. So I set him up on a drafting table, and I took him from guns to water skis to other things. Today, a lot of them are engineering draftsmen. Because they told me that the kids, they only had an IQ of 24 or something. You can't get to them. Well, I said to one of these kids with an IQ of 24, suppose you wanted to rob that jewelry store across the way. How would you go about any way at all? Well, I said, I throw a bag of fecal matter in there, and the guy gets mad at my friend, he runs in, and I clean off the counter. That's where they live. I suppose you wanted to rob the third story. No ladders, no ropes, no weights. How will you get up to the third story? Well, after several days, one of the youngsters came up with a piece of wood. He didn't even know what a wedge was. You see that hunk of wood? I can stick it in the bricks and it gets tight no matter how far the bricks are, see, from one another. And I can climb up the god. He didn't use that language. He used much much stronger language. I climb up the building and take whatever I want to take. That's how I do it. Well, how do you give people an IQ test that come from a different environment? How do you know what they sense? Do you think that the formalist who tries to structure the nature of intelligence, the nature of creativity, without being creative, can do it? Well, in order to teach children how to become creative, I make a Martian out of rubber with eyes on tentacles and a pointed rear end. And they look at it, and they say, nah. And I say to them, what good are three eyes or four eyes on tentacles? Eventually, when you look at the back, the front, the side, the top at the same time. And what if the guy had six arms? Well, he can shave, read a book, eat a donut, and drink coffee. Instead of, nah, as we're brought up. If you met a Martian, they had an opening on the air. So, what's that? Notice the attitude? What is that? Well, if we eat anything that's bad for us, it's ejected right away. Not in your system. It goes through your whole system. So you're taught in medical school how wonderful the human body is. How wonderful it is. This isn't true at all. That you're indoctrinated to a set of values that are unreal. And in order for me to get these ideas out there, it's extremely difficult because we need films, we need equipment in order to do that. What the Venus Project has to offer is a way of life without ambiguity, a language that has a, a much more precise form of communication to change the relationship between people where the male and female are not given separate roles. Where the female say, I want to be a biochemist or a physicist, and she goes that way. When you hand a girl a doll, you're placing a set. You're beginning to manipulate the people. Everybody's afraid of controlling human behavior. You're always controlling behavior. When you pick up your little girl and say, don't play with that little Lutheran boy across the way, and you put him down again, or don't talk to that little Catholic girl across the way, well, you're always indoctrinating children. Children. Who loves you more than anything in the world? The candy store man. No, your mommy and your daddy. See, indoctrination continuously. And then all of us together sing, we are free. Let's go. We are free. So beware. Whenever you hear of freedom and all that sort of thing, watch out. Because a real free society, the closest I've ever come to it was in Polynesia. I lived in the South Pacific Islands for a while, and the natives gave me bananas and coconuts. All that. They were very generous, and they had no words for work. Would you believe that? They went fishing all day, they played, they had luau's. And they said, Junk, you know, uh, what you want? And I said, Well, I would like an outrigger canoe, and they built one for me. A few days after they brought it to my hut, I heard some rustling outside, and they were all carrying the canoe away. I said, what's going on? Said, you no use. It was a different value system. Now, the men and women walked around nude on the island when I got it a long time ago. And I never saw a native poke another native, hey, get a load of that chick. None of that. None of that. They looked at the eyes of women when they talked to them. 
Never. Hey, look at that. Never at the legs. The motion picture cameras and all your movie theaters are dolling up and down the hindquarters and all. And you wonder why men are like that. They are not like that. They are made like that by culture. Then the missionaries arrive. And the little girls used to come to church, you know, innocent, listening. And they put the T-shirts on them. And the girls had no idea why they were putting the T-shirts on them. What's it for? It's like me covering your nose. You can't go into room B unless your nose is covered. Well, the girls cut two holes in the T-shirts and came to church. So we're dealing with many different cultures, subcultures, and values. Our culture, if we are to grow and build a civilization worthy of humankind, we have to have a quantum jump in the way we look at our world, people, and ourselves. The Venus Project is the redesign of a culture in which the elements that comprise the culture are different. For example, our cities are round, not because I like round cities. The city is round. The center of the city has a socially integrated computer. This may be a medical center. This might be an engineering center. And if you work in the medical center, you live in beautiful gardens with running streams and waterfalls. And every district is the same distance from the center. There are no cars in the city. You get on a conveyor and dial where you want to go to. There's no crime in the city. Just before the public library in the United States, People said, well, you can't really do that. The people never bring back the books. They'll keep them. They won't return them. Of course, all that was incorrect. I want to build a library where any child can walk in, check out a camera, check out art materials, check out water skis, make things available. People don't steal. No one's going to hit you on the head to take your watch off if it's available. Well, how are you going to pay for this central library? that gives children these things for nothing. Well, it cost about 50,000 bucks to keep a kid in jail one year. An adult, 75,000 bucks a year. Food, clothing, shelter, dental care. Isn't it easier to do it in a different way? I would love to go to Mexico and say, what's your problem? They say, well, senor, we don't have the modern machinery you have. Give them modern machinery. Build schools for them. And they won't be coming over the border. What makes them come over the border? Hunger, lack of employment. They say, oh, it's the goddamn Mexicans, you know what they're like. Oh, there's nothing like that. Everything is shoved by something else. You are told that a tree falls over. You are told that a sailboat sails. A sailboat cannot sail unless acted upon by a resident force called the wind. A tree does not fall. If it rains and it's asymmetric and the soil becomes loose, gravity does the rest. The tree doesn't fall. Plants do not grow. They require radiant energy, nutrients, water. Stop any of those things and the plant stops. Human beings are not self operating entities. We are operated by many resident forces. Of course, many of us are not aware of that. It looks like we're perfectly free making our own decisions. I know I think for myself. I'm sure you do. That's an illusion. Because if you're brought up to believe in the Kennedy rocker, you want one for your home. It'll injure your back, distort your anatomy. But Kennedy had one like that, and I want one like that. When you break the patterns that have been established by existing society, you begin to move people in a new direction. I admit I could get up here and give a very pleasant lecture of how wonderful everything will be in the future. A helicopter in every garage, you know, a house in suburbia, another on the beach, maybe one in Hawaii. This is the future. That is not the future. Those are the illusion generators, and there are lots of them. Gregory once told me that being black and living in the South, Dick Gregory, he said, whenever I was late for work, I couldn't run to the bus because they would wonder what that blackie was up to. Running. See? In other words, we project our value system into others. We project characteristics into others. 
We have to find out what we are really like. Now, there are many people tell me they want to find themselves. This is another ridiculous thing. Who are you going to find? Some jerk at 18 and a different value system at 23? You can never find yourself if you read, keep up with new ideas. What self? The self of 20? When I was 15, I was a jerk. And as time went on, I learned more about many different things and knew how much I had to learn in order to move forward. There is no finding yourself. People come over to me and say, I want to know how I relate to the cosmos. We don't even know how a single cell splits. And they want to know how they relate to the cosmos. What a bunch of verbal crap. Really, it's meaningless. And so, I'm sorry that I only have one hour to try to give you ideas along different lines. Generally, it takes seminars. It takes a lot of demonstration and films. I did not mean to offend any of you. I hope that I didn't. Thank you for your time. Yes. Um, I teach middle school kids. In, what, what do you see? I'm a little hard of hearing. I'm sorry about that. I teach middle school kids, and I wondered some of your philosophies of education. Okay. In that Got the point. Uh, for example, in our city design, we have big lakes. We've made all these lakes. They exist. It's real. We have modern structures there, all different. Roxanne said to me, my associate, she said, Jock, I just don't want to draw pretty pictures of buildings. I want to build them, I want to make them. And she did all the cement work. And one day she came over and she said, how about a swimming pool? And she was with a girlfriend. I said, when do you girls want to start? Well, we never built a pool. They built it in two weeks, a beautiful pool. We'll show you pictures of it. And so we built a big lake in the city. And there's a hill in the middle of the lake, about 80 feet up out of the water. And on top of the hill is a craft shop where children can build anything they want to build. But in order to get there, you got to get in a boat and row it. Instead of lining them up and say, come on, everybody together, forward, backward, now. Arrange the environment so you have to row to get to the hill. You have to climb the hill to get to the craft shop. And an automobile or anything you build will not go together unless four children pick up the car and the others put the wheels on. Instead of saying, I want you people to work together and cooperate and stop fighting. Arrange things so that it works that way. That's what nature does. When a fox, a baby fox, sees a porcupine and says, wait a minute, what have we here? He says, I don't know. And he gets close to the porcupine. Finally, he gets a quill and he stays away from the porcupine. But if you raise your children and try to avoid experiences that had hurt you, and you buy them every toy that they want, you produce a blob of jello. Some degree of challenge, some degree of stress is necessary. And so we build an environment, try to answer your question, with the elements so arranged as to produce what you call creativity. Can I give you one more bit on that? All right. Is there anyone else interested in creativity in children? You raise your hands? OK. What we do is we, I ask a child to make a drawing. Anything they want to draw, and this is what they usually do. Can everybody see the blackboard? Well, I'll draw it up here. They draw something like this. I'm talking about four and five-year-olds. Then they draw something like this. And, and then most of them do something like this. I'm sure you've all seen those drawings. In fact, I'm sure many of you draw that way today. Yeah. <laughs> and so the teacher gives them some crayon, and they color it, and she hangs it up. This is little Billy's drawing. But when she tells Billy that this is the way we spell cat, and Billy says, I see. And he comes back with something like this. Can you see that? The teacher says, that's wrong. That isn't wrong. Most of it is appropriate. It's just this that we change. So I say, very close. We just substitute this with something like this. 
And then the child comes back again with something like this. I say, much closer, much better. Only we turn this around so you can put the A inside of it. Say whatever you have to say to get the idea across. Instead of saying, well, that isn't, that isn't what I told you. Well, oh, you're just using that child as an outlet for insufficiency. Then I do this with the children. I have them draw the letter T. And I say, which one of these looked like a peach pit? The child generally picks this. I say, you, those of you back there, I'm sure you can't see that. And the blackboard is fully cluttered and I don't have, here, I'll try to clear an area where most of you can see. The child draws the letter T and he draws a peach pit in the middle. Then he draws one peach pit here and one there and he takes out the middle peach pit. Then I say, what is this? They say, that's a bunch of birdies flying. This is good. You move down a peach pit and a half and draw the letter V upside down. And the child draws the letter V upside down. Then he draws a birdie under the V, one peach pit down like this. And then he joins another birdie to that and a half round beneath that and one peach pit above. He does this. And then I say to the child, what is this? That's a heart. I said, good. Half a heart from the top of the eyebrow to the bottom of the nose. And they move from that offensive drawing made by the child to this in less than a half hour. And I'm talking about five and six year olds moving into this realm, drawing sports cars, turning them around. And we talk, we give them crayon and chalk because we want them to bring out their artistic ability. You can't bring out anything if there's no basis or structure for it. If you sit in the woods and meditate on your navel for three years, you'll have a tremendously clear picture of the navel and nothing more. So you have to work to get information. You have to arrange things so that it generates what you call creativity. Now a, psychology, uh, a psychologist in one session said that, well, I know two children that came from the same environment, and if environment is everything, one turned out to be a gangster, the other a minister. If environment is everything, how do you get those differences? The minute you pick up one child, and start playing with it, and the other stands there with that lift out, you're making jealousy and envy. There's no such thing as the same environment. So when I pick up my little girl, I pick up my older little boy. You never work with one child. Why can't you keep your area clean? Your brother does all the time. You leave all your things around. Well, when he trips and falls down the stairs, his brother smiles, an inhibited smile of us. But he does smile. So we build these artificialities in the world we live in today. We've got to interfere and change things. Those of you that would like to know more about the Venus Project, we have a video, a tape, and a book introducing the basic uh, conceptual layout of what it's about. Any other questions? Uh, I, I can't go into more detail. Yes? I find your views about the future interesting, but how do you account for human nature? How do I account for what? Human nature. Human nature. Human nature uh, is the way people have found other people to behave over many long years. They appear to manifest greed, jealousy, envy, even animals. If you take a cat and put it on your lap in the presence of the dog, the dog may growl. And a psychologist, that's what I mean by the nature of the beast. So I said, come on down to my lab in about a week. So I picked up my cat, put it on my lap, and the dog's tail starts wagging. Because you reinforce the dog before you pick up the cat and put it. The cat is a threat to the dog's security. The dog wants you to pet it, not the cat. So 
You, you give the dog these ambivalent feelings. But you can have 15 kids in the room without jealousy, without envy. It is not human nature. It's human behavior that's shaped by culture. If, like I said, if you were brought up in China years ago, you'd walk with your hands in your sleeves and shuffle and wear a long pigtail. And so, well, that's human nature. That's not. That's the influence of environment on your behavior. Dancing is the same thing. Dances change over a period of time. Music changes over time. So there is really no human nature. Think about it, toss it around. There is varying degrees of human behavior. If we wish to understand the factors that generate our value system, that generate the way we look at the world, you have to go back in time and study these things. I'm sorry again, I can't go into much more detail, just a general overview of the Venus Project. Yes? You mentioned a universal language. Are you speaking about something like Esperanto? No, that wouldn't do. Or interlingua? Yes. No, that wouldn't do. The language has to have a physical reference. In other words, that means that suppose we took some tungsten and hit it with high-pitched sound. And bouncing off that tungsten, a pattern occurred on a screen that looked like that. Now, this was the nickel, and this is the iron, and, and we learned how to chart that pattern. When you wrote tungsten, you do this in the future. So it's always like chemistry, like a pharmacologist reads a prescription, assuming the doctor's handwriting is good. He looks at that prescription, and it turns out the same product. We don't want individuality in that area. We want uniformity. Is there a place for individuality? You know, in the next few years, the word individuality will go the way all the other crude and vulgar terms went. Individuality, when you buy a Mercedes, if you can afford it, and you turn the key, you want it to start, not sometimes, all the time. And when you turn, you want it to turn. And when you put the brakes on, you want it to stop. So it's called quality control. Variations in human behavior, which we call individuality today, is poor quality control. In the future, the question of people, then wouldn't everybody be uniform then? Well, the question of uniformity is essentially this. They will uniformly like anyone they meet, uniformly share ideas and resources, uniformly share knowledge with everyone else, and uniformly courteous to everyone else. That's the only kind of uniformity. As far as the accumulation of wealth, property, and power, this will be considered part of the age of the Bulgarians. To, to us, this is all normal. This is a thing to do, to become successful. Well, in my early days, I wanted to be successful, and a company came to me and he said, we have a bunch of Mexican women and Indian women that sit at a conveyor belt and they pick the black beans and they pick the white beans, throw them in another box, and they said, can you uh, improve that? I said, how far do you want to go? How many beans can you deliver? So what I did in the early days is I built a big bicycle wheel with hollow spokes that turned like an airplane propeller into a vat of beans, sucking up one bean to each vacuum tube. And then there was a photoelectric cell here. If the bean was black, it tripped it with a wire. And as you sit and watch, those beans went up like this in the big vat. And in eight hours, we did the work that 50 women took three months to do. Now, I would like my machines to come in, but I would like them to get a shorter workday, an increase in purchasing power. If machines do not improve the lives of people that work in automobile factories. If they're automated out of existence, so will you be automated out of existence. All of us can be automated out. Roxanne uh, recently had some area, she does architectural renderings, site plans. There are machines that do that some, some years ago. CAD. There are machines today that make models. If you take a vase and put it on the table and it's scanned, they have a laser beam that penetrates a fluid and solidifies that fluid in the exact shape of that vase. You can do it to England, China, anywhere in the world. <coughs> and I want to repeat this. 
Machines today, that is three months ago, could handle 500 trillion bits of information per second. I don't care how many humans you get together, there's no place for human behavior in the next 20 years. There's no place for human participation in the next 20 years, or maybe less. No one can predict the future precisely. I am not gentle, I don't pull my punches, I can't afford it. I respect you, I like you too much. I would rather tell you things as they are, not generate additional illusions.